welcome to the 2021 Distinguished Scientist Fellows Award Ceremony. I'm Dr. Katie Schroeder Spain, the Coordinating Program Manager, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. I would like to say a special word of welcome to the Department of Energy's leadership from headquarters in attendance today, as well as a welcome to the DOE National Laboratory directors, nomination teams, award merit peer reviewers, and of course, the 2021 fellows, their families, and invited guests. Up first, it is my pleasure to introduce the De uh, Deputy Secretary of Energy, David Turk, who has provided pre-recorded remarks. Hello, everyone, and thanks for inviting me to be part of today's ceremony to honor these truly exceptional scientists. On behalf of all of us at the Department of Energy and the Biden administration, congratulations, a hearty congratulations to Drs. Hammett, Kiesling, and Lung on this prestigious award. This award recognizes the people behind the incredible scientific accomplishments at our national labs. Thank you for your leadership, your contributions to our nation's legacy of innovation and for mentoring our next generation of scientists as well. We know that inspiring and supporting the next generation of these scientists is crucial for our nation's ability to lead in innovation and address tomorrow's toughest challenges. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Secretary Granholm and I refer to the Department of Energy as America's Solutions Department, and you three are the perfect example of that, pioneering tomorrow's solutions in plasma physics and bioenergy and in climate modeling. The Biden administration recognizes the critical role of fundamental research in keeping our country safe, healthy, and ahead of the technology curve. We know the work that our national labs are doing on this uh, today to provide the foundational knowledge we need to solve big problems for tomorrow. The work we do today is that foundation upon which all these solutions will be built upon. We're committed to giving our scientists, our researchers, our innovation, our innovators, the resources and freedom you need to carry out curiosity-driven research at the most basic levels. This award only scratches the surface. The president's proposed budget for the upcoming fiscal year requests a significant, a historic level of increase for DOE's Office of Science and our national labs. But we also need to do a better job communicating to the American public why investing in basic research is so essential for our nation's security and economic success. And that's where we need your help in working together to communicate about the incredible science going on day in and day out at our national labs not just through awards like this, so well-deserved awards like this, but every day. So congratulations again to our three awardees, and I look forward to seeing where your careers take you into the future. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the ceremony. Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Secretary Turk. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. J. Stephen Binkley, Acting Director of Office of Science and Principal Deputy Director in the Office of Science. Dr. Binkley? Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Katie. Hello and welcome everyone. I am really pleased to have the opportunity to share this time with you today and celebrate the 2021 Distinguished Scientist Fellows, Drs. Greg Hammett, Jay Kiesling, and L. Ruby Lung. Selection for this award is very, very highly competitive. Fellows were nominated by teams of esteemed colleagues and endorsed by each of their laboratories, lab directors, uh, their innovation, innovative accomplishments in the fields of plasma physics, synthetic biology, and climate modeling are outstanding and highlight the impressive research and innovation that the DOE National Laboratories can and do support. Each fellow will receive $1 million in direct funding to be used to support their activities that develop, sustain, and promote scientific <clears throat> and academic excellence in Office of Science Research through collaborations between institutions of higher education and national laboratories. Office of Science first conferred this award in 2019, and I have been impressed and inspired by the achievements of the nominations submitted this year and in each of the prior years uh, by the national labs. And I want to sincerely thank all 17 national laboratories for nominating so many worthy and prestigious candidates. And now, without further delay, we will continue on with the conferment of the awards. Katie, what's next? 
Thank you so much, Dr. Binkley. So now it is my pleasure to welcome the 2021 Distinguished Fellows back to our virtual stage. As, as I introduce each fellow, we will take a virtual photo of each fellow with Dr. Binkley, who will then read their award citations. Fellows, please turn on your cameras at this time. Great. It is my pleasure to introduce Distinguished Scientist Fellow, Dr. Gregory W. Hammett of Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. Dr. Binkley. I present this award to Dr. Greg Hammett for his leading the development of the quantitative theory and simulation of plasma turbul turbulence in fusion and astrophysics, and for educating and mentoring a diverse, diverse group of graduate, graduate students and early career researchers. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a real honor. <laughs> it doesn't show up, but uh, it's, it's, it's a real honor. Um, on, on behalf of many people I've worked with, thank you. Up next. It is my pleasure to introduce Distinguished Scientist Fellow, Dr. Jay Kiesling of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Dr. Binkley. I present this award to Dr. Jay Kiesling for his national scientific leadership in synthetic biology that has advanced DOE's strategy in renewable energy, especially the realization of biofuels and bioproducts <clears throat> that enable biomanufacturing at scale and inspired and grow the U.S. bioeconomy. Congratulations, Jay. Thank you very much. It's a real honor. Up next. It is my pleasure to introduce Distinguished Scientist Fellow, Dr. L. Ruby Lung of Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Dr. Binkley. I present this award to Dr. L. Ruby Lung for her pioneering new approaches in climate modeling, the discovery of unexpected impacts of regional climate change, and understanding extreme weather events and their future changes. Congratulations, Ruby. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is a great honor for me, but I also want to express my appreciation for all the teamwork that make this possible. Now, on behalf of the Department of Energy, congratulations again to the 2021 Distinguished Scientist Fellows for selection for this prestigious award and for your achievements. Members of the audience, please give the fellows a virtual round of applause as we assemble the fellows for a group photo. Fellows, also give your distinguished colleagues a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Now we will hear from the fellows who have provided brief pre-recorded remarks summarizing the importance of their scientific works. At this time, speakers, please make sure your microphones are muted and your videos are turned off. We will hear from the fellows in alphabetical order. First, Dr. Gregory Hammett, then Jay Kiesling, closing with L. Ruby Lung. Following the video, we will begin the roundtable discussion with the 2021 fellows, which will be moderated by Dr. Harriet Kung, Office of Science Deputy Director for Science Programs. Hello, my name is Greg Hammett, and I am a physicist at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, where I do research on fusion energy. I'm also a lecturer with rank of professor at Princeton. I'm deeply honored by this award, and I want to thank my close collaborators and graduate students. It has been a real team effort. I also want to thank the Department of Energy and the American taxpayer for supporting research like this and making this possible. To give you my big picture view on fusion, fusion energy is hard and a lot remains to make it a reality on earth, but I think we are making good progress and there are interesting ideas being pursued that could reduce the cost of fusion. We need to pursue multiple strategies to deal with climate change. Fusion is one of the few long-term options that can provide a reliable energy source to balance the intermittency of wind and solar. As computational and theoretical physicists, we have been working to help the fusion program by developing increasingly realistic computer simulations that can help design better fusion reactors. In the 1990s and 2000s, we and our colleagues developed fairly sophisticated plasma turbulence codes that could explain key features of experiments in the core region of tokamaks. When I was in grad school in the 80s, many, most of my professors thought this would never be possible. 
uh, that plasma turbulence was too complicated. In large part, this has been made possible by advances in supercomputers that are a million times faster than 25 years ago. But supercomputers alone are not enough. Tokamaks are very complicated, and so are the codes that we need to simulate them. It requires a lot of expert human effort to write these codes. The present challenge is to develop codes that can handle the edge region of tokamaks, which is much harder to simulate. But we are making progress as illustrated in this recent simulation of how edge turbulence can push around magnetic field lines. With this DOE award, I plan to apply this new edge turbulence code to understand some methods that might help make fusion devices better, such as using lithium coatings on walls, which has been observed to significantly increase the temperature of the plasma in experiments at Princeton. We will also apply this code to understand the effects of different sh shapes for the magnetic cage that, that holds a hot plasma. This work has been a team effort and there are many I need to thank, including my closest collaborators in the early days of fusion research underlined here. I want to thank my current collaborators who are developing the code that we will be using in this research. I've learned so much over the years from an excellent group of graduate students. All of us have so many people to thank in life for the things that we do. But I particularly want to thank my wife, Kate, for her love and her support, helping me stay somewhat balanced. Thank you all. Hello, my name is Jake Kiesling. I am a senior faculty scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and Chief Executive Officer of the Joint Bioenergy Institute. I am deeply honored to receive this award for my work in synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is the engineering of biology with standardized, well-characterized biological components. Using these components, synthetic biologists are making biological engineering more reliable, easier, and less expensive than with traditional genetic engineering techniques. And the resulting engineered organisms are safer. Not only will synthetic biology enable a host of important applications to solve societal problems, it will decrease the cost of doing biological research. As an example, my laboratory has engineered bacteria and yeast to produce natural products, molecules that are naturally produced by plants or other organisms. Many of these products are used as therapies, flavors, fragrances, pest control agents, and vitamins. General, generally, they're produced in minute quantities by the natural producer. We clone the genes responsible for their production from the natural producer and place those genes in bacteria or yeast so the engineered microorganism produces the desired molecule in large quantity from sugars or another renewable resource. Not only can this path produce chemicals in a more affordable way, it can also be better for the environment. The Joint Bioenergy Institute, one of four DOE bioenergy research centers, is using the advances in synthetic biology to engineer microorganisms to transform sugars and aromatics derived from lignocellulosic biomass into hydrocarbon-based biofuels that have the same qualities as the fuels that are currently derived from petroleum. These advanced fuels do not require a change in transportation infrastructure, will reduce the production of greenhouse gases, reduce our dependence on foreign oil, and add to the US agriculture economy. Very similar technologies are being used at JBay to engineer plants to become more efficient producers of lignocellulosic biomass with minimal input of water and fertilizer. Indeed, these advances in synthetic biology will allow us to have plentiful food to feed the population of the US and the world, as well as biomass for fuels. Federal funding has played a critical role in the development of synthetic biology. In particular, the funding from the US Department of Energy has been transformative for biofuels and bioproducts. I thank them for the support of synthetic biology research. Finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues at Berkeley Lab, the University of California, Berkeley, the Joint Bioenergy Institute, and in particular, the postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, undergraduate students, and high school students who have worked with me over the years. Again, I'm deeply honored to receive this award. Thank you. My name is Ruby Leung, and I'm a Patel Fellow 
at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I am extremely honored to be selected for the 2021 SC Distinguished Scientist Fellows for pioneering new approaches in climate modeling, the discovery of unexpected impacts of regional climate change, and understanding extreme weather events and their future changes. I'm very grateful for a fulfilling career at PNNL. As a climate scientist, I ask questions like, has our climate changed in the past? How will our climate change in the future? What are the reasons for these changes? What are the implications of these changes for the people, the society, and the ecosystems? I address these questions by developing and using numerical models that describe the climate system. I use observations to evaluate our models, and then I combine observations with models to test hypotheses of what causes climate change and how climate change manifests in changes in the environments and the resources that matter to us. I have seen and contributed to significant advances in our field in the last decades. We now have access to more data, more advanced modeling, analysis, and measurement tools, more solid theories, and more resources to pursue our research. But at the same time, we are also facing more questions, not only questions that naturally emerge as we dig deeper in our research, but also questions that are driven by societal needs to cope with climate change. With more demand for climate information, comes more challenges and responsibilities, but also opportunities. I have been fortunate to be a part of the climate science community, working together to meet the challenges of fundamental as well as youth-inspired research. I thank the Department of Energy and my management for supporting my research and endeavors, and I deeply appreciate my colleagues and collaborators for sharing a fun journey of discovery together. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now I would like to re-welcome the 2021 Distinguished Scientist Fellows back to the virtual stage for the roundtable discussion. Fellows, please switch your cameras on at this time. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Harriet Kung, Deputy Director for the Science Programs and the Department of Energy's Office of Science, who will moderate today's discussion. Dr. Kung. Thank you, Katie. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me first, by adding my heartfelt congratulations to the three fellow awardees of this year. What an incredibly exciting journey each of you have had in reaching this important stage of your career. Um, what we have planned next is the roundtable discussion to probe a little deeper uh, in each of your background, your experiences, especially to seek your insights on a number of topics of great interest to us and hopefully to those of you tuning in today. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So let me start uh, with a general question, which is what motivated you to get into your field? Um, let's start with Greg. Greg, over to you. Uh, okay. Um, well, I was always interested in math and science as a kid. Um, my father was very into cars and I'd helped him fix his cars. He was a, uh, an Air Force pilot and into technical things. So he, he taught me a lot, of, um, a lot of physics for the first time, or at least I heard about it um, way before I could really understand it, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and you know, what that was. Uh, but then I graduated from high school in 1976 in the middle of the energy crisis. And I saw the impact that energy had on the economy and on life. And so, I, I got interested in fusion then. Um, fusion energy is a possible way to you know, use physics and for an application that um, might be helpful someday. So that's, that's kind of how, how I got started. Great, thank you. Really fascinating. Uh, who wants to go next? Uh, Jay, you wanna go next? Sure, so um, genetic engineering got its start in the early 70s. And uh, shortly thereafter, Genentech was founded. And I remember reading about that in Time Magazine as a kid and thought that was just so exciting that you could engineer organisms to produce new products, uh, things that would be useful for humans. And so uh, I just got 
deeply excited about genetics and genetic manipulation and uh, went to undergraduate to do it, uh, uh, undergraduate degrees to do it and then in graduate school. And I've been doing it ever since. Thank you, thank you. Ruby? All right, so um, I studied physics for my undergraduate degree. Among the various subjects in physics, I was more interested in fluid mechanics. So for graduate school, I thought maybe I should I would study weather because um, that sounds interesting as weather is determined by the atmosphere, which is basically a fluid. So I enrolled myself in atmospheric science in graduate school without knowing too much about the different subdisciplines. I thought studying atmospheric science to improve weather forecasts could be useful. But then during graduate school, uh, instead of weather, <laughs> I became much more intrigued by the complexity of the climate system, and I wonder how predictable climate is. So I started asking questions like how a small perturbation in the energy balance by the greenhouse gases may result in climate change. So this essentially kicked me off um, a long journey to use numerical models to look at global climate change, but also its regional impacts. So I, I would say what keeps me interested in this field is the straddling between fundamental science and use inspired science. I find a lot of satisfaction in explaining certain phenomena, why they happen, but I also very interested in connecting them uh, to the societal implications. Thank you. It's actually fascinating to hear all three of you really have that big vision and also as well as this desire to have broader impact and, and focus on societal ch challenges. And that's truly uh, is inspirational. Uh, another thing that I've noticed also through all three of your nomination packages uh, is that you have all have shown to be very successful um, in mentoring young scientists. I think some of you mentioned in your recorded remarks. Many of, uh, of your uh, uh, early career colleagues have assumed leadership positions at various institutions around the country. So would you be willing to share some of your strategy for kind of motivating young people, ensuring that they have a successful career path? Um, maybe let's start with Jay, okay. Sure. Um, uh, I think I think there's a few things that that I try to um, abide by always in mentoring, and that is um, not to be too heavy-handed in it, to give them lots of of room to grow and and do the kinds of exciting things that they might want to do, to give them uh, all the resources to do it, um, and to be there to guide them. I, I think that in many ways, the best way to develop future scientists is to help them, let them find their own way, but, but help them uh, and give them the resources necessary so that they can try to accomplish what they want. I also think bringing in the most diverse group of people, uh, diverse in uh, ethnic background, diverse in in every aspect, including scientific, scientific disciplines, so that um, they all get exposed to new things and can see the broader world out there. Great, thank you. That's really true. Uh, very, very important uh, uh, experience in, in really paving the foundation so they not only feel secure, but also having the resources uh, for them to be successful. Um, Okay, so who wants to go next? I don't know, uh, Ruby or Greg? Ruby, okay, Maybe go I, ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so working at the national lab, I have mentored um, many post postdoctoral fellows, uh, junior scientists, and also visiting graduate students. Generally, I think they came already motivated, but what's important is to keep the fire in their bellies, <laughs> right? So, so I think um, it's, it's important to find interesting and important science questions that stimulate their creative thinking. Uh, I usually challenge young scientists with big science questions, but then also give them a lot of freedom as well as some guidance to narrow down the questions into bite sizes. Right? So helping young scientists to see the forest as well as the trees and to see how the research fits in the bigger challenges, I think it's really important to keep them motivated. Um, I also provide sufficient resources and a collaborative environment for them to learn from one another and grow. Okay, thank you, Ruby. 
Let's turn to Greg. I don't have much to add on this. Um, I think I, uh, in my early days, you know, I worked very closely with students and we were really in, in the in the minutia of, of everything. Um, uh, I'm trying to have a more hands-on approach like Jay's describing uh, as I get older um, <laughs> and, and, tr and try, trying to, to learn, learn how, how to do that effectively. Right, so, so maybe a, a follow on question is that, um, you know, not all of our national laboratories have had good uh, sources of students or early career. Uh, so what is kind of the strategy for you to especially promoting underrepresented uh, groups from underrepresented uh, communities, HBCU, MSIs? What's your uh, perspective on some of the successful strategy that you have in reaching out to that uh, uh, that group of uh, scientists, maybe I can start here and then they can add in. So, um, one program that I'm particularly proud of that we have running at JBay is a high school program where we bring in high school students um, from some of the local high schools, and these aren't necessarily the best students. These aren't the students maybe that think of science first. They're, they uh, tend to come from economically disadvantaged neighborhoods and schools. Um, they tend to be students of color. Um, and when they go to college, they tend to be the first ones uh, in their families to have attended college. And we've had an amazing success rate bringing them in over a summer, helping them with their college applications, but also teaching them the basics of synthetic biology and microbiology and, and biofuels. And uh, about 80% of those students, when they go to college, end up in STEM disciplines. And so I think one important aspect or strategy we're working on is trying to fill the pipeline so that down the road, we have more and more uh, students uh, of color, um, a, a diverse pool of students uh, coming into the, the system. Um, I think it's also important to, um, when you're recruiting people, to make sure that um, the, the teams of people that are, are on the committees deciding who's going to be recruited and hired, that those be diverse teams and that you have a diverse applicant pool. Um, and I think all of these can lead uh, to getting more diversity in the scientific pipeline, which we so uh, much need. Absolutely. Um, anyone else? Ruby, Greg, anything mm -hmm. to add? Go ahead, Ruby. Yeah, okay, I, I can add something. Um, I think creating opportunities for the underrepresented group is one key to, to increasing diversity. And opportunities can take many, many different forms. Uh, for example, um, as an editor of two journals, I'm always mindful to increase the diversity of the reviewer pool. Uh, being a reviewer is, is an important experience for young scientists to learn about publishing and also exposing them to opportunities in the future for awards or joining uh, editorial boards. And then there are also many other opportunities, for example, in our professional societies that we can use to entrain uh, underrepresented groups to be more embedded in their communities and support one another. And then there are also many training opportunities offered offer by programs like the National GEM Fellowship, which promotes participation of underrepresented groups in postgraduate STEM, fellow, uh, STEM education. So this past summer, I hosted a GEM Fellow and found the experience very rewarding. At PNNL, the lab where I work, um, we have a program called Young Women in Science. Uh, that provides opportunities for high school students to work in the summer uh, to gain some experience working at National Lab. So these are the various opportunities that, that we can use or create to, to help the underrepresented groups to expose them to, to, to STEM education and, and, and as such. But besides um, providing opportunities, I think a more diverse career path may also help attract a more diverse pool of students because they can see themselves contributing in different ways and they can also see some flexibility in moving between tracks or ladders like between academia, working at the national lab or working for the government or private sectors. 
Exactly. Actually, between the uh, two of your remarks, I, I sense there is a central theme that this mentorship is actually very important as in not only recruiting, but also retaining them in STEM. So before I return to the both of you, maybe Greg, do you have any additional sure. insights to add, add? Sure, sure. I can um, add a couple of things. Um, so one of the things that Princeton University has recently started is a pre-doc, a pre-doctoral program in which um, we, and a number of other universities have, have, have these things also, um, in which we look for uh, really bright students, but who maybe might not have had as many opportunities in high school and college. And so um, we're giving them it, who could benefit from an extra, an extra year of courses and mentoring before they start a, a regular graduate program. So, so that's one thing. And I, I think this GEM program is really good that, that Ruby mentioned. Um, if there are students interested in pursuing that, um, it's uh, gemfellowship.org, G-E-M fellowship.org. Uh, a number of national lab, DOE national labs and major employers are, are sponsors of, of that program. Um, and then we, we also run a high school program for, for women in, in science and engineering. Uh, they have several hundred people, cut, several hundred kids come to this, this conference every year before COVID. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all virtual now, yeah. Great, thank you. So maybe let's, if we could kind of return to this mentorship, especially in the national lab environment, any particular lessons learned, best practices that any of you would be interested in sharing, being a good mentor at a natural lab uh, setting? Jake? Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, Nothing specific, um, you know, students, um, it, you know, scientists have been studying their one thing for so long and they have to remember to look up and remember how to communicate that to a kid who's in high school or college and they're learning a lot, but, you know, um, so just, just meeting them with regularly and, um, you know, fr frequently at the beginning um, is, is one thing we try to do. Um, we, we, we run a summer program for college students um, and recruit um, uh, mentors from across across the the scientists and and engineers running um, you know so to divide up the mentoring work uh, among a, a lot of the scientists uh, is one thing that helps. Yeah, you know, I'd say national labs have a lot of advantages um, in terms of doing science. I mean, one is big science and access to resources that national labs have. Um, like light sources and, and other facilities. And, and you don't often get that in a university setting. Often in a university setting, um, you might be stovepiped into a department and, and they're starting to break out of that. But it's not like in a national lab where uh, you know, things don't necessarily all fit into a department and the departments aren't necessarily the same as the disciplines. And so you've got this, this opportunity for cross fertilization. And I think uh, Ruby mentioned this, it's, it's this kind of non-traditional approach and, and working at the interfaces and, and teaching people that there's a, so many opportunities there at the interfaces, particularly where there isn't say one particular role model of how you should go. Um, and that you know, path blazing opportunity um, it can really be uh, wonderful for students once they discover it and, and are comfortable with it. Hey, thank you. Anything to add, Ruby? Yeah, well, so I think Greg and, and Jay already made a lot of great points. I just want to add that indeed working at the National Lab is, is interesting, but as well as challenging because National Labs are generally pretty big and there are many organizations within a National Lab, uh, which is a great thing because then you can really learn from, for example, if you work on climate science, you might want to make connections with people who do mathematics or computational science to help you. So I, I think in a sense, um, we can help um, when we mentor uh, young scientists, we can help make, uh, help them make this kind of connections to see the bigger picture and to 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 also reach out to other uh, uh, folks in other disciplines to to really advance the research. Great, thank you, thank you. So for for really insightful perspective and and comments. 
So in the remaining couple more minutes, uh, let's address this last question, which is a pretty fun one, uh, which is, what do you look forward to the most in the coming years in terms of progress and impact of your research, especially impact on society? I think each of you have been really eloquent in, in stating that in your uh, record message. So who wants to go first? Oh. I can go. I can go yes, first. go ahead, Jay. All right. You know, um, we as, as a society have been kind of polluting the environment with carbon dioxide. Uh, we've been polluting it with plastics, uh, lots of products that have made our lives better, but haven't necessarily made the environment better. And I think there's um, a really interesting space for biology to uh, produce products that will be better for the environment like biofuels, but also things like biodegradable plastics and, and other advanced materials that will not only be better for us and, and provide new properties, but also will help the planet. And the planet desperately needs it right now. And so I'm looking forward uh, to a day where we have uh, biofuels in all of our airplanes and renewable plastics that biodegrade in the environment when we forget to recycle them. Great, wonderful, thank you. Uh, who wants to go next? I, I can go next and give Great. Ruby the, the last word on this. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I, as I mentioned in, in my pre-recorded talk, I think there are re some really interesting ideas in, in fusion that could lead to better power plants. And uh, I think this next decade, through experiments and through really comprehensive computer simulations, we're going to be able to test out some of these ideas and get a better idea of if, if, if they will, will really work. Um, the ITER experiment that the U.S. is part of is it will be getting their first results uh, near the end of the decade. And um, I'm really excited about supercomputers that are coming online. The, um, this in just, just the next couple of years, uh, a new generation of exascale computers are coming out. These are um, a thousand times faster than the fastest supercomputers in 2008, which was you know, not that long ago. The things that we can achieve with these are, um, it's just opening up real new frontiers in, in the level of, of realism that, and uh, being able to solve problems in, in the science, in many areas of the sciences. Um, all, um, yeah. Um, and, and this requires computer codes that are sufficiently realistic, but I, I think we are getting there in, and in particular in fusion. I think we're gonna have the types of codes um, with, with enough realism that handle the complexities of, of plasma turbulence to really be able to optimize the design of a fusion reactor. Uh, some things that I'm not directly involved in, um, but our, our lab is, uh, the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab is, um, plasmas are used to to manufacture computer chips and the chips in our phones um, in many devices. Um, there's a lot of different steps in making these devices, but a lot of them involve plasmas. And uh, PPL has some interesting um, initiatives to try to help US capabilities in, in improving the, the way that, that we make these computer chips. And um, related to that are some ideas that people have at our lab um, of how to make a device that can be used for quantum computing. This is somewhat speculative, but um, you know, quantum computing is, is another really hot topic uh, and it may be really useful for certain applications. And uh, you know, who, who knows what will work out and, and what, will, what won't be, what, what, what will not work, but uh, I'm, you know, I'm excited to, to, to see how some of these things pan out. Really exciting frontiers. Ruby, while well, you have the All last right. word. <laughs> yes, thank you. So I'm a climate modeler, and in my remarks, as I uh, as said earlier, there is a lot of increasing demand for climate information. So what I really look forward to seeing are uh, breakthroughs in our ability to model the climate system. Right? So we want to be able to provide more accurate as well as more spatially detailed climate information so that we can support management and planning of resources and improving the societal resilience to climate change. So, so then you might wonder, I mean, is it really possible for this type of breakthrough? I think it might be possible because we have we have seen advances in high performance computing. I'm really looking forward to exascale computers that allow us to, to run 
our climate model on this type of uh, machine, but also using newer methods and tools uh, such as uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, as well as more rigorous um, mathematical tools and as such. But also very importantly, I think it, this type of breakthrough might be possible with a diverse talent pool. Um, I think with the increasing awareness of climate change and its impact, this might be a golden time for us to attract talented students to carry the torch forward. Great, thank you. This is truly exciting, truly ins inspiring remarks. So uh, with that, we conclude this roundtable discussion and let me turn it back to Katie. Thank you. Congratulations again. Thank you. With that, that ends our uh, ceremony today. Uh, thank you for everyone for attending. We, we really appreciate your time and uh, the, the chance to share this, this time with you. Um, and congratulations again to our 2021 fellows. Uh, thank you, everyone. Be well. <laughs>